First Peter chapter 5 is our text tonight, and we're going to learn really about this matter of walking in grace. And so First Peter uh, chapter 5, and we'll read uh, beginning in just a moment in verse number 5, and uh, then uh, we'll have our Bible study and uh, have some other announcements at the end of the Bible study time. First Peter 5, and beginning in verse 5, and we'll read down through verse number 9. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time to gather together, and I pray tonight that you would strengthen us through your word, uh, bless our time of study, and uh, our time of prayer, and we'll thank you for this time as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we enter the holiday season, this is always a time when our busyness is more pronounced and it seems like uh, Christians during this time either move forward or they lose ground spiritually. Uh, It's either a time to really grow forward or sometimes we can miss the the lessons of the season and and, uh, not grow at all. And it's my prayer that each of you will grow in grace during this season. When Peter wrote this epistle to the Christians of the Roman provinces of Bithynia, Asia Minor, Galatia, and so forth, there was much persecution upon the church in the first century. And as, Paul, as Peter was writing to these churches, he was acutely aware of their persecution. He knew that they were paying a price for their faith. And so he is writing to them to admonish them to encourage them in order that they would stay steadfast for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, It's amazing to me as we live now in this age of 2022 in the United States of America uh, that we also are facing uh, challenges on every hand. Uh, And it's important for us to take passages like we're going to study tonight and apply them to our own hearts because as we face these challenges, uh, we certainly want Uh, to be a church that is steadfast for the Lord Jesus Christ. It seems like as a church and as a church administration, we're often these days looking at how to posture and how to stand properly in a culture uh, that is growing more and more uh, against the Word of God, the things of God, uh, in a culture that oftentimes is not uh, respectful towards religious liberty. And we're having to be constantly seeking wisdom that we might uh, redeem the time in which we are living. But you know, as that is important for the church as a whole, it's so important for each of us as individuals. And so the key is to learn in times of challenge to walk in the grace of God. And I want you to see tonight what that means. What does it really mean to walk a grace walk? What does it mean uh, to walk gracefully under pressure? And I want you to see three thoughts that Peter shares that will help all of us tonight. First of all, God is calling us as gracious Christians to a submissive walk to a submissive walk. The Bible says in chapter 5 and verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Now, the foundation of a successful Christian life is remaining faithfully with the Lord, connected with the Lord, bound to the Lord. Uh, We must recognize this dynamic relationship under the almighty hand of God. 
John 15, 5 is familiar to all of us. It says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. And so this walk with the Lord is a cooperative walk. It's a submissive walk. It's, it's a recognizing that, Lord, I can't do this without you. I don't even want to try as Moses said, Lord, if you don't go with me, I don't want to go. And here we see in the Word of God that Peter is challenging these Christians to a submissive, uh, humble walk. Now, first of all, it takes grace to be humble. It takes the grace of God to walk in humility. Humility is the opposite of pride. God can't work with us when we are proud. Uh, in fact, he resists us when we are proud. And this is what the Bible says. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. James chapter 4 and verse 6, the Bible says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Now let's read that. It's in your notes, I believe. James 4, 6. Ready to begin. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, Humility and submission to God are given as the keys to an effective spiritual walk. God says, I'm going to give you grace, but I, I, I want you in that grace to walk humbly before me. God resists the proud, but God exalts the humble. And the scriptures tell us here, humble yourselves, therefore, uh, as unto the Lord. Uh, bring yourself low. Come to a place of recognizing uh, that God calls upon each of us to walk in humility. Now, notice what it says in verse 6. It says, if you humble yourselves, therefore, in the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So God says, I'll, I'll lift you up. I'll, I'll use you, but it's going to be in my time. And, uh, you know, waiting times are not wasting times. Sometimes we we're, we're tend to get impatient with God. Sometimes we want answers. We want them now. We want a promotion. We want it now. But God says, just humble yourself. Uh, bow yourself down to me. Have a submissive heart to where you are, to what you're doing. I know your address. I'll, I'll bless you. I'll meet your need. I'll lift you up. But I first want to know your heart. And so it is that God is calling upon us today to humble ourselves. You know, uh, when you're persecuted, when you're picked on, sometimes uh, you want to pick a fight back. Sometimes you want to uh, make someone else look bad. You want to take things into your own hands. God says to these believers who are suffering, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll exalt you in due time. I'll lift you up. But I want you right now to humble yourself through this time. Jerry Bridges wrote, humility then is a recognition that we are at the same time a uh, worm Jacob and a mighty threshing sledge, completely weak as helpless in ourselves, but powerful and useless by the grace, uh, but powerful and useful by the grace of God. In and of ourselves, we're uh, not useful, but by the grace of God, we can be exalted and we can be useful. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth. Jesus is our ultimate example in one who humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so here we have this challenge uh, that we would grow in grace to the point of humility. Elizabeth Elliot once wrote, does God ask us to do what is beneath us? This question will never trouble us again if we consider the Lord of heaven taking a towel and washing his disciples' feet. And remember, uh, the towel and the basin are symbols of redemptive ministry, that Jesus was willing to wash his disciples' feet. I love the story of two missionaries in China who were there at the time of Hudson Taylor, and they lived in what we would call a missionary compound. It was kind of a little housing complex for missionaries. And there in that compound area, uh, there had come a flood and much rain had caused a lot of debris to come into the sewage area and block it up. 
Well, there were two young missionaries standing over that sewer, and as they stood there, uh, they were uh, arguing about who should clean it out. And one was giving his credentials. He was Cambridge trained, and he was this, and he was that. And uh, it was beneath him to clean it out. The other was Oxford trained, and he was giving his credentials. And while they argued about who should or shouldn't clean out the trash, the story is told that Hudson Taylor climbed down into the sewer and pulled the trash out and solved the problem. This is what God is calling us to do. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Many times knowledge puffeth up. And many times we can become convinced that we're above certain tasks. But Elizabeth Elliot, the missionary widow, she said, does God ask us to do what is beneath us? This question will never trouble us again if we consider the Lord of heaven taking a towel and washing feet. I've watched many men who come maybe out of Bible college or come into the faith as new men in the church, ladies in the church, and, and they begin willing to do just about anything. But after a while, certain things are beneath them. I always find times when the wind is blowing and the tumbleweeds are coming across our campus, it's as if God is reminding me, hey, no one's too big to pick up a tumbleweed and throw it away. Don't ever forget that there's no job too small with the Lord. It may be encouraging a child. It may be just blessing someone that uh, can't ever bless you in return. But God calls us to have uh, this type of grace in our life. It takes grace to walk this way, grace uh, to humility. But secondly, it takes grace to trust the Lord. Now, I want you to see this in verse 7 as we look at this grace walk. It is a submissive walk which means walking in humility, but it also means walking in trust. Verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. All right, let's say that together. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. One more time. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Now, you know what I have found? That is the greatest, most wonderful, easy verse to quote until something terrible comes into your life right? Suddenly you've got a big problem. Suddenly there's something in your marriage, something in your health. And you know that verse is there and you can quote it, but it's hard to do it. And, and yet uh, this is written to people who were in the crucible of stress. I mean, they, they were losing their jobs. Their lives were being threatened. Uh, I stood several weeks ago with Pastor Wendell and some of the members of our church uh, in the uh, theater area of Ephesus where uh, Christians were oftentimes persecuted, and certainly uh, there was an uproar in the city because of what had taken place spiritually there. And, and certainly uh, these believers live with fear at times, and yet the message to them was casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. I was texting with our, our congressman, Mike Garcia, one of the Little things that we could do from East Lancaster to help America was to send a good man like that to Congress. This, just today, uh, he was uh, finally uh, sent there officially. And, uh, and so we were texting about a matter for the college, and I, I uh, asked him where he was, and he said he was in D.C. And I said, we're going to Bible study in a few minutes. And I shared these verses with him, casting all your care upon him. And then the next verse, verse 8, uh, your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion. And you know, uh, here is a man who's uh, going in as a, a, a believer, going into a challenging opportunity to serve, and he'll have many burdens. And uh, I don't know about you, I don't envy that type of a job, that type of an atmosphere. But aren't you glad to know that, know where, that wherever you are, wherever you're serving, you can cast your cares upon the Lord. And this is what we learn from verse 7. We can trust him. Remember Philippians 4.13, I can do all things, how? Through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And here's a word in verse 7. It says, casting all your care upon him. Literally just throwing your cares upon him. And this is what God wants us to do. You know, uh, I think about how trusting children are. And when our kids were little, I sometimes would put them up on the top of the car and I'd say, jump to daddy, jump right here. And you know, they would just throw themselves at you and they would just jump and, and didn't think twice about it. Why? They completely trusted that I wasn't going to drop them, at least intentionally. Uh, they put their trust in me. And God wants us to do that 
with him. You might be going through a tough season tonight. <clears throat> you, might, you might feel a little bit overwhelmed with everything on your plate right now. And sometimes we have days and even weeks, maybe a month or more like that. But during those times, it's good to remember to cast all of your care upon him. I, I tell you something that, that all of us can learn is that it's all going to be there tomorrow. And give it to the Lord and trust him and he'll help us along the way. Hudson Taylor said it this way, all of God's greats have been weak men who did great exploits for God because they reckoned on God being faithful. Let me read that again. All of God's greats have been weak men who did great exploits for God because they reckoned on God being faithful. Uh, I was uh, interviewing someone just recently for a, an opportunity in our ministry, and they said, wow, I just don't know that I could do that. I just don't feel worthy to do that. I'm not sure that I'm qualified to do that. And I said, that's just the kind of person we're looking for. We don't want someone who thinks they have all the answers. They're the Bible answer man. They've got all the answers for all of life's problems. You know, it's, it's okay if you feel sometimes inadequate. It's okay if you sometimes feel overwhelmed because then you'll know when the job gets done that it wasn't all about you. It was all about God through you. And you will get through this season and you will get through that task and you will get through the trial, but you'll get through it quicker if you cast all of your care upon the Lord. I can do all things through Christ. And now notice the word casting. It means to throw upon. And then notice next the word cares, uh, the Greek word merinma. It speaks of anxiety. It's, it speaks of putting all of your anxiety upon him. And uh, we're living in an anxious day. Uh, through COVID, there's been uh, a great, great increase in anxiety and discouragement upon people. And, uh, and, and we're sometimes seeing people struggle to come out of it. But we must learn to cast all of our cares upon him. Notice another word in this little verse. It says, casting all your care upon him. What's the last phrase say? What? He careth for you. He careth for you. I like this word too. It means he has regard for you. God has regard for you. He thinks of you. He knows you. He cares for you. You know, I don't know why it is, but when we go through stressful times, it's very easy to feel like no one cares. No one knows. It's very easy to feel like, you know, I'm doing all this stuff and it just, just seems like uh, no one even knows what I'm doing. But I want you to take note of this verse tonight. God knows. He has regard for you. He cares for you. Casting all your care upon him, he careth for you. Psalm 55, 22, cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. And so here we see that a submissive walk is a walk that involves these matters of walking humbly before the Lord and walking trusting in the Lord. That's what it means to have a submissive walk. It's to say, Lord, I'm going to bow down to you. I'm not going to be filled up with myself. Lord, I'm going to cast this to you. I'm going to trust you with this along the way. And what a tremendous blessing to consider that God gives grace to people. He'll give you more grace as you keep trusting in him and keep trusting in him. He gives more grace. And so the walk of grace is first of all a submissive walk. The person that's fighting and arguing, there's no grace in that. But the person that's humbly trusting God, that is an evidence of his grace. And whether it's in your marriage and just saying, I don't understand everything that we go through, but I know that God will bring us through it. Let's just keep trusting the Lord or whether it's at work or something else. Just to keep trusting the Lord is a sign of humility. It's a sign of Christian growth to keep your trust in the Lord every step of the way. How many of you have noticed that sometimes the trials last just long enough to get us to really trust him the way we should? 
Sometimes God allows these trials for a particular season to bring us to that place of growing in grace and trusting Him. So it is a submissive walk. Now, the second aspect of this grace walk is that there must be a sober watch. There's, there's not only submission, but there's soberness involved. Now, notice this in verse 8. It says, be sober. Let's say that together. Be sober. I've never preached in a bar, but if I did, that might be a good text. Amen? And uh, that's, I know it's a different uh, connotation, but be sober. Be sober. Uh, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, the word be sober means to be alert to danger. Be alert. Be circumspect. Be temperate. Uh, be aware of the fact that the devil wants to take you out. He wants you out of your marriage, out of church, out of commission as a witness. Be aware of that. Be always aware of that. This is why the Bible says, seeing then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Deliberately take notice, God says. I want you to be on guard all the time. Uh, Ephesians 6.11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Folks, we have got to be alert to the danger. About the time we let our guard down, Satan's going to come and attack us. And constantly uh, we see that the devil's trying to take Christians and destroy their testimony and destroy their relationships. We must be sober. We must be alert. I um, uh, had the opportunity a uh, week before last to spend a few days with a man who served our country over in Afghanistan and Iraq. And, and uh, we were talking about uh, his trip out west and he had come through some of the uh, metal detectors and he says, they always beep when I go through. And I said, why? He said, because I've got a lot of shrapnel still in me from when I served our country. And uh, he was describing to me some of the missions that he was on and and how he had to be so very cautious and alert and sober every step of the way. He said every, every single time we would go out of our base, uh, we were a target. He said just every single minute of every uh, single operation, you knew that you could be struck in just an instant. And three different times he uh, took enemy fire and, and was wounded serving our nation. He said... You'd never go out of the base without realizing that you could take fire at any time. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to recognize that the minute we walk out of our house, before we leave our house every single day, Satan has got you in the crosshairs. Satan would like to take you down. He would like to take you out. And we must be sober. We must be alert. Always alert to this fact. Be alert to the danger. Be aware of the devastation that could come. Verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, seeketh whom he may devour. We must be watchful for the temptation. The word vigilant means to give strict attention. Warren Wiersbe wrote of this passage, who better than Peter would know about the prowlings of Satan? Several times Jesus warned Peter that Satan was after him, but he failed to heed the warning. Too many Christians, uh, too many Christians have gone asleep opening the way for Satan to work. And uh, you visit the Holy Land and you can go uh, not far from the old city of Jerusalem to Caiaphas' house and there's a monument with a rooster on the top of the monument uh, as a reminder of Peter's denial of Jesus Christ. A man who said, I'll give my life for you. A man who thought himself uh, to be above the others in bravery and uh, who would defend the Lord Jesus Christ. And what did he do? He denied the Lord Jesus Christ. And how did that happen? He missed just enough church, just enough Bible reading. You say, is that in the text? Well, he followed from afar. He said he was a believer, but he didn't have time to stay too close to Jesus. And I'm telling you, when you neglect the Word of God and you neglect prayer and you neglect uh, a church attendance and you just kind of start following from a distance, 
suddenly and, and without much warning, many times the temptations will come. And so it is that each and every one of us can learn from this challenge to be aware of the devastation. And uh, here we see we must have a sober watch, and we can learn that from Peter. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said, When thou sleepest, think that thou art resting on the battlefield. When thou walkest, suspect an ambush in every hedge. In other words, be ready at all times. Be filled up with the Scripture. Be walking in prayer. Be walking in the Spirit. Listen to uh, sermons. Listen to the Word of God. Read the Word of God. I'm reading a wonderful book right now uh, by Packer on knowing God, knowing uh, the presence of God and being sensitive to the Spirit of God. And, And all of this exercise unto godliness will help us Uh, to be aware when Satan's throwing his fiery darts at us. We must be watchful for the temptations. Secondly, we must be mindful of the consequences. Notice in verse 8 again, it says, uh, seeking, uh, it says, your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now think of the consequences. First of all, I want you to notice the word adversary. Adversary. The word adversary means your opponent. You know, sometimes you think that your adversary is your, is your wife or your husband. That's not your adversary. That's your friend. Sometimes as I watch some Christians, you think that some other Christian is their adversary. That's not your adversary. Uh, the, the adversary that is fighting against you is Satan. And we need to remember uh, that the Bible says he is seeking. He is plotting. Uh, you ever seen how a lion will plot and just so very quietly get as close as he can? And that's exactly how Satan is. He's seeking, and then notice that word, you've seen it before, whom he may devour. There's uh, different commentaries, wrote different things about this word, but one said this, and I thought it was pretty graphic. It said, to gulp down entirely. To gulp down entirely. I'm not talking about how your children eat. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what Satan wants to do with you. He wants to take you with one bite. And he wants to eradicate you and your testimony. He wants to ruin your testimony. Robert Murray McShane said, I know well that when Christ is nearest, Satan is busiest. In other words, he doesn't like you being in God's house. He's watching and constantly seeking whom he may devour. And so uh, we want to be careful as we walk with a sober watch. Jerry Bridges said, while God most often appeals to our wills through our reason, sin and Satan usually appeal to us through our desires. And so it is uh, that many times it will be the emotional pull. Many times uh, it'll be discouragement, depression. Uh, Many times it'll be the the, uh, melancholic spouse pulling the other spouse down. Uh, It'll be the one uh, that is caught up into some uh, lack of faithfulness in the word. It'll be, uh, there'll be a weaker one, pull another one down, oftentimes in relationships. And so there will be a submissive walk if we're growing in grace, and there will be a sober watch. Someone that's growing in grace uh, is, uh, clearly understands the scripture which says, let he that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. In other words, if they're growing in grace, they know that I could be right now in the worst of situations were it not for the grace of God. And they recognize it and they live their life that way in the state of, in an alert state. So if you're on the grace walk, you are on a submissive walk, humbling yourself before the Lord. You are on a sober watch. You're constantly watching uh, for that Uh, sarcasm, that uh, bad connotation, that temptation to complain, uh, that, uh, that draw to the world. You're watching that all the time. That friend that used to be a good friend that, that really taught the truth and now uh, they've found a little better way and they're constantly trying to draw you in and, and, and trying to get you perhaps a friend or your spouse through Facebook, through whatever it is, to go down this pathway of destruction. And God says that we've got to be sober and watchful for those temptations. Then notice finally tonight, the grace walk is not only submissive and sober, but thirdly, it is a steadfast warfare. It's a steadfast warfare. Now, notice in verse 9, it says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren 
that are in the world. Now, I don't want to be discouraging tonight, but I want to be honest with you. The Christian life is a battle. It is a battle. And uh, the way I've got it figured out now, uh, after 40, uh, uh, after, excuse me, 50 years of being saved now, is that uh, the battles are never going to stop. There will always be battles until we see the Lord Jesus face to face. So, uh, so with that mindset, we must be steadfast in the warfare. Now notice how we can be steadfast. Notice this, it says uh, in verse 9, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Now, how can we resist our opponent? How, how can we have victory? Well, first of all, we must resist with the truth. Let's look at some of these words here. It says, first of all, resist. The word resist, of course, means to oppose, to stand against. By the way, if you're saved, there are some things you're going to be standing against. That's why I passed out the form tonight and said, call and give your uh, statement that you're against gay marriage. If you're saved, if you believe the Bible, you're going to be for some things, you're going to be against some things. And that's just what it means to be a dedicated Christian. You're going to resist some things. Uh, Longman said, the readers, however, are not called to fear the devil. They are called to opposition. In other words, he's, he's not telling them uh, to walk around fearful of the devil. The readers of this epistle are challenged to oppose the devil, to resist him steadfastly. And this is a spiritual battle. They're to stand firm. How many of you are thankful tonight for the verse that says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it? That we are on the winning side. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Nowhere does it say to run from the devil. We're to resist the devil and stand, uh, in, in, stand before uh, the devil. And so it is that we are to resist. Now notice again in verse 9, whom resist, then notice the next word, steadfast, strong, firm, immovable. You heard of the two men that were walking out in the forest and they were walking down a path and suddenly they came upon a huge giant bear. And as they saw the bear, one of the fellows turned around, he was getting ready to run and his friend said, wait. He said, don't run. He said, don't you remember what we learned when we studied about camping? He said, we're supposed to stand here and we're supposed to look the bear right in the eyes and we're supposed to yell at the bear and tell him to leave. And, uh, and, and, th and that's how you deal with the bear problem. And they stood there for a minute and the bear kept getting closer. And the other man said to his friend, he said, he said, I read that pamphlet and you read that pamphlet, but did the bear read that pamphlet? He wasn't too sure if they were safe or not. But I'm here to tell you that you never win a battle by running from Satan. So many people think that's the answer. So many people think that's the answer. It's like the little girl that answered the phone and the man said, is your, is your daddy home? I'd like to speak to him. And uh, he was a pastor and the little girl said, no. Said, uh, uh, my daddy uh, got, a, got a call from another church that wants him to be their pastor. And he's in the other room praying about it. And the man said, well, can I talk to your mother? And she said, oh, she can't talk. She's busy packing right now. You know, a lot of times people are just quick to run from their trials. Pastors are quick to run from their trials. Church members are quick to run from their trials. Boy, the devil can get a big thing going and, and uh, suddenly someone thinks it's time to leave. It's time to leave. They say the average pastor leaves his church over five disgruntled members. If the pastor leaves, the disgruntled members stay. If the pastor stays, the disgruntled members leave. But so oftentimes, pastor will get discouraged and leave. I talk to pastors nearly every day like that. Many times I'll see church members, they get discouraged and the devil's fighting against them and they're having trouble with the neighbor, they're having trouble with work, they're having trouble with plumbing, they're having just trouble, trouble, trouble. And before you know it, uh, they think that maybe they just need to turn and run from it. But what does the Bible say here in verse 8? It, it says, verse 9, it says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith. God is calling us to be steadfast, immovable, to resist when Satan is fighting. And we must resist with the truth. I love this phrase, resist steadfast in the faith. Notice, secondly, resist in the faith. Now, this, this term, the faith, 
uh, uh, it refers to the biblical doctrines of the Word of God. We learn here that the only way to fight Satan is with the Word of God. It's always interesting to me that when people begin to struggle spiritually, the first thing they do is miss preaching. And it only enhances the problem. What we need more than anything when we're going through the battles is the reinforcement of the Word of God. We must have strengthening from the Word of God. Now, let me remind you of that in Matthew 4. Notice what Jesus said here. So important. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You know the story. Jesus was fasting 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. Satan came to him and tempted him. On one occasion, he said, If you be the Son of God, then cast these stones and turn them into bread. Satan was tempting Jesus. And Jesus said, It is written. Let's say that together. It is written. That's why I often carry Bible verses in my pocket. You say, well, you're a pastor. You have to carry verses in your pocket because there are times when the devil may be fighting me in some particular area and I'll read a verse and I'll say, man, that's exactly what we needed. Oh, that's a great verse. Here's a verse I'm carrying this week. I'll just read it to you. Jeremiah 9, 23. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he that understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exerciseth loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. In other words, glory in the Lord. Don't glory in the other things. That spoke to my heart. I put it in my pocket. Why? Because there are times when the Lord just speaks to you about something and you need that scripture and you need to be able to quote it out and recall it. And that's how we fight Satan. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, we're to resist in the faith. In other words, it is our faith, the word of God, that allows us to to fight. Uh, I believe it was Spurgeon who said, it is written, stand upon it. And if the devil were 50 devils in one, he could not overcome you. On the other hand, if you leave, it is written, Satan knows more about reasoning than you do. He is far older. He has studied mankind very thoroughly, and he knows all of our weak points. Therefore, the contest will be an unequal one. Do not argue with him, but wave in his face the banner of God's word. Satan cannot endure the infallible truth, for it is death to the falsehood of which he is father. You see, Satan is no match for the Word of God. And we must say, it is written. Get thee behind me, Satan. And we must determine that we will resist him with God's Word. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Let's notice this as we close tonight. What a wonderful verse. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is what? Common to man. Now, by the way, the word temptation refers not only to what we might consider temptation to sin, but it refers to trials. It refers to the heaviness of life. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is what? Faithful. He is faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Don't be surprised when attacks come. They're going to come. Don't be surprised. Expect them. Expect them every step of the way. You know, our police officers today, we had a good number of men that were just doing some jogging around the Sheriff's Department Police Academy. I don't know if it was on purpose or an accident, but somebody crossed over the street and ran right into those uh, young cadets. Uh, one of them is on a ventilator right now. And you know, it's amazing the day we live in. People need to be so careful physically. I, I hardly ever, I don't think I ever say goodbye to my children if they're leaving the house or if I'm leaving their house, whatever. I always tell them, be careful. Be safe now out there. Be careful as you drive. Why? Because I know how people drive and 
I, I, I know the world we're living in. If I love my children that way, how much more does God love you? How much more does God want to protect you and help you? And he knows when you're burdened, but he says there's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. Don't get filled up with self-pity and pride thinking you're the only one. God says, others have been here. You're going to get through it. I'm going to help you get through it. I'm going to make a way of escape. And the way is the grace way. It's God working in you. Grace is a disposition of the Holy Spirit of God. It's you having God's power and God's enablement within your life. And it will reveal itself in three ways. A submissive walk. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. A sober watch. I can't handle this today. I could get a bad attitude. I could complain. I could say a bad word. I, I, can't, I can't handle this. I'm going to have to be watchful because the devil's going to try to take me down today and hurt my testimony. And then a steadfast warfare. I'm going to square up with the word of God against Satan I'm going to fight the good fight. And, and the battle is going to be won as I take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And it is written, Satan, get behind me. And I'm going to keep doing the battle every step of the way. And I promise you, when you're in the Word, and when you're coming to work, and you're coming to do whatever you do tomorrow, and you take the Word of God with you, and you're sober, and you're vigilant, you're going to have victory, not because of yourself, but because of the Holy Spirit within you and because of the Word of God, you'll be able, through the grace walk, to have victory day by day by day. And so I encourage you uh, that you take God's Word, even these next few days before Sunday, and that you stand steadfast uh, fighting against Satan. No doubt he hates the church. No doubt he's throwing more darts than ever. He's on his last big throw and dart party, but guess what? He's a loser. And the Word of God will bring the victory. But you will not know the victory unless you're steadfast in the Word of God.